to uh, conduct this meeting, um, members of uh, the applicants team will be given the opportunity to uh, give a full and uninterrupted presentation. I will urge the applicants uh, from the get-go to give uh, the most concise possible uh, presentation. We have uh, two pretty uh, broad uh, applications tonight that are going to uh, require quite a bit of time. So we want to make sure that we get uh, the substance uh, in a concise fashion and uh, allow for enough time to ask our questions and make our comments. Uh, so the applicants will be uh, giving a presentation uh, uninterrupted. Concluding this presentation, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions. Once this question period concludes, I will open up the floor to members of the public. Members of, of the public will have an opportunity to ask questions and make comments. Once this uh, question and comment period from members of the public uh, concludes, we will move to business session. During business session, only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter, meaning that at that point, members of the public, elected officials, and the applicants are no longer allowed to speak unless recognized by the chair. Members of the committee will uh, discuss the matter, uh, a motion will be made, and a vote will be taken on this motion. Uh, the vote of this motion becomes the position of the committee. This position is referred to the full board for uh, their ratification. Uh, the full board meets on Thursday, February the 12th, I believe. Uh, double check on uh, our website uh, to make sure this is correct. Um, but it is basically Thursday next week. Um, the motion from the committee will be uh, presented to the full board. The full board will vote on uh, the uh, uh, determination of the committee. The vote of the full board becomes the official position of Community Board 5. This official position will then be forwarded to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, as well as other uh, stakeholders, such as our elected officials and, of course, the applicants themselves. Um, I will uh, remind that if you have a conflict of interest uh, from uh, members of the committee, you should disclose it before you make any comment or ask any questions. Um, so with all of that being said, uh, I'm going to uh, turn to the applicant. We're going to start with uh, the uh, Commodore uh, project. Um, I think we have a uh, team of robust team of applicants uh, with us tonight. Uh, if you want to uh, start sharing your screen and uh, we can get the uh, presentation going. And as I said, if you can be as concise as possible, that would be much appreciated. Okay. Yeah, on one sec. Um, Vicki and everyone else, it's great to be back with you. I'm Jeff Nelson with RXR. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so um, as many of you know, we're partnered with TF Cornerstone on the redevelopment of the Grand Hyatt site at Lexington and 42nd, directly adjacent to Grand Central. Obviously, it's great to be back with all of you. Um, we've already met with land use and transportation in preparation for our scoping, and now we're here uh, with the Landmarks Committee. And specifically, as Vicki mentioned, because we've submitted an application to LPC for two items related to our project. Um, Rami, you can flip to the agenda. So the two items are first LPC will review and issue a report related to the pro project's harmonious relationship to Grand Central. Um, that report will examine the relationship specifically between the exterior of our proposed development and the terminal. Um, and that's a requirement of the special permits that we're seeking through our upcoming EULER. The other element um, of LPC review regards improvements that will be done on the Grand Central Terminal lot itself, um, that's along the 42nd Street passageway and also at the viaduct level. Um, the terminal itself is under state historic preservation jurisdiction. Um, so these materials that we'll go through are being submitted to LPC for advisory review. Um, this is a pretty standard coordination between the two ag agencies. Uh, next slide, Rami. Um, so in terms of, um, uh, the site location, you all know it well, but just to orient you and show the interrelationship, obviously we sit right next to Grand Central Station, which is indicated by lot one here. The development site is in red. Um, we sit above the Lexington Avenue 42nd Street subway platform and tracks. 
and that'll be a key consideration that we'll touch on in the presentation that informs the design you've seen. On the next slide, just some brief history. Uh, <laughs> You all recognize this gentleman. Uh, in the late 70s, um, this became Donald Trump's first New York project, the gut renovation and recladding of the old Commodore Hotel. Uh, Trump is the one who proposed the current design that we see today with that building clad in you know, dark glass facade that gives it a pretty imposing and uninviting presence on 42nd Street. Hyatt did a uh, interior renovation in 2011, but really the the building you see today was Donald Trump's uh, imagination and vision at work. Um, so on the next slide, uh, as, a, as a reminder, if you need one, um, the presence of, of this building in such a prominent and critically important location has presented a lot of challenges for decades. Um, that's both with respect to the transit network and also to the public realm, and importantly, its relationship to Grand Central. So on the view you see looking east, you see the building's imposing presence with no setbacks at all from the lot line. It clashes architecturally with Grand Central. You have retail spaces that are dated and dark. And then the sidewalks, you know, in a, in a let's call it post or pre-pandemic world um, are obviously very congested uh, as well. Um, and then you have that cantilever on 42nd Street that you can also see, um, which just, you know, blocks light and, and adds to a feeling of, of congestion and tightness on the sidewalk. Um, the problems aren't just on the exterior, um, they're also on the interior. Uh, the current building leads and contributes to congestion going into the subway system. The image on the right is um, that really terrible entrance off the 42nd Street Passage that's actually going down into the Grand Hyatt site where all that congestion happens. Um, and then even below that, there are structural girders from the building that block sight lines and circulation. So what's the solution to all of this? Um, well, we're, we plan to demolish the building and construct a new modern mixed use project. Um, and we think we're gonna do that in a way that's you know, really respectful and, and sympathetic to the Grand Central Terminal in a way that the existing building isn't. So the new project, it's a mixed use building, as many of you know, it's comprised of new class A office space and a new replacement hotel of 500 keys. Um, an element that we're really proud about and which you all have seen um, in the scoping presentation that was done previously are a lot of the public realm and transit improvements. You'll see some more detail on the public realm in particular tonight and how that introduces a new experience and vantage points to the terminal. Uh, so to realize a project of this magnitude, um, it's quite a substantial undertaking, undertaking, we brought on a team of architects and engineers led by SOM and also with Buyer Blinder Bell, which oversaw the original Grand Central renovation to advise on how the project interfaces with the terminal. Um, we think in working with this team, um, that we've really developed a design that is harmonious with Grand Central and that responds to this site's location next to um, this great asset, this great landmark in Grand Central. We think you'll see that harmonious relationship um, through the, the, the setbacks we've put in place and how the build, building is oriented, how the public realm is oriented, the textures and materiality that we've chosen and the um, tremendous thought that we think has gone into this. Um, we're very proud of the work we've done and excited to show it to you. So I wanna turn it over to Rami uh, from SOM to, to go through the project in detail. Rami. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm Rami, I'm with SOM, uh, and I'm very excited to be showing you this. Uh, so in this first part of the presentation, I'm going to take you through the documents that were submitted to LPC as part of the harmonious relationship application. And then uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a later portion, we'll go through the changes to lot one, as Jeff said. Uh, and to begin the conversation about the harmonious relationship, we're going to start with the base and streetscape, which is where that relationship is at its most critical and, and at its most perceptible. The current Grand Hyatt rises vertically right from the property line up into a sheer uh, vertical wall. 
Uh, and as we saw earlier, it cantilevers over the sidewalk. So it not only goes up vertically, but also con continues to obstruct the pedestrian experience along 42nd Street. Uh, it's also particularly jarring because uh, there's very little registration of the human scale uh, and of the pedestrian scale within, within the design. That's very vexing on 42nd Street specifically because 42nd Street uh, uh, features buildings that specifically acknowledge that human scale. Uh, the best example of that, of course, is the terminal itself, which you see on the lower right hand side, where the plinth of the terminal itself does a great job at acknowledging a single story specifically related to the pedestrian scale. As we all know, the main massing of the terminal uh, is set back. And so our project will acknowledge this single story plinth level and extend it into the site in, or in order to preser preserve this datum of a human scale. Later on, we're gonna explain how that extension also allows the creation of this exceptional public realm that will be elevated um, up at that viaduct level. Now, once we've extended that plinth, uh, up above that plinth, we're going to place the tower's core, so the elevator core, uh, and the main lobby up on that elevated plinth level. So that will be similar to the way that the terminal and its mass itself also sits above that plinth level. So there's, a, there's gonna be a very strong correlation between the two. We're gonna reinforce that correlation by using a similar stone to clad uh, our core that will be sympathetic to the stone that clads the terminal itself. And you're also gonna see a similar language of solids and voids um, animates the surface of our core. Uh, the terminal and our core both sit in approximate alignment when you look at them in plan. And so that will further help uh, that resonance between the two. As Jeff said earlier, this is one of the most infrastructurally challenging sites uh, in the city. It's a very, very infrastructurally dense site. What you're seeing in this diagram on the left here is uh, the train and subway tracks that limit our ability to place structure of a, of a building wherever we want. And so one major driver here of the design is where can you actually put structure down in a way that does not interfere with train tracks and subway tracks below. And as you can see, we've identified two primary locations along 42nd Street. Those are the only points where you can really bring structure down uh, to meet terra firma, uh, so to meet uh, bedrock, without interfering with the train tracks. On the right, you see how there's a desire for us to actually express that structure on the outside and really bundle it down in order to meet those uh, strategic points. Um, and so uh, this becomes a, a primary feature of our building. The structural expression and the way that it meets the ground becomes a, a very important part of the building's design. It's gonna create a specific rhythm. It's gonna create a specific depth. And so the, the structural expression will be indistinguishable from the architectural expression as well. Uh, uh, so, and, and of course, when you look at the terminal, that's true too. The terminal's facade is defined by this marching rhythm of columns that create depth, that create articulation. Evidently, we're not trying to replicate uh, the terminal or to mimic it in any way, um, but, but we do wanna be, but we do wanna create a building that has depth that isn't just a glass, a, sheet, a simple sheet of glass or a flat sheet of glass. You know, we've learned from the current building and from so many others that that's just not how we want to design um, our buildings in this city. Above here, you can see the way that those structural columns are going to bundle in order to meet uh, uh, concrete mega columns that will then descend uh, onto bedrock. Uh, other than helping us overcome this major structural limitation, this bundling of the columns. Uh, is actually really going to help us set up this harmonious relationship in three ways. It's going to increase the available space between the terminal and our building. It's going to create new sheds of uh, new view sheds of the landmark from 42nd Street, and it's going to create open spaces available to the public that will valorize the landmark. And we're going to show you how. As you can see in this view, this is a view from the southern sidewalk along 42nd Street, uh, a building rising up from the, uh, from the property line would evidently conceal the terminal. And so often you walk by that intersection without even noticing that, that the terminal is there. So very critical for us to, to, uh, to really bring the building in 
so that it doesn't emerge straight from the sidewalk, but actually recedes away from the sidewalk in order to open up these view sheds to the main features of the terminal. The parting of the structure will also create views not just on the outside, but also through the lobby. Because this will essentially be a column-free uh, lobby on the interior, you'll be able to have these direct relationships to the eastern face of the terminal, which will for the first time be revealed to a pedestrian walking along 42nd Street. Uh, and this is something that we're particularly excited by. And even as you get closer to the building, uh, you can see just how much relief you'll get from the current condition. So the current condition that rises straight up versus our proposed condition that recedes away in order to really liberate that massive corner. Uh, these are some rendered views that show you how that will manifest. So here you're seeing uh, 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 the eastern face of the terminal revealed through the lobby, as well as on the outside. Again, as a visual reminder of where the current tower would sit, it would sit all the way out here on the property line. Uh, you'll also see the attention that we've paid uh, to, to the texture and scale of the different elements that uh, will interact with the, human, with the human scale and with the pedestrian scale here. We're crossing the street, so this is the same view from across the street. Uh, and again, here you can see the way that the eastern facade of the terminal will be revealed and the way in which uh, we're creating harmony by extending the level of that plinth into our site. Uh, another thing that I want to point out here is this resonance I was talking about earlier between the interior of our core and the terminal itself using compatible materials, a language of solids and voids, and uh, again, a kind of very similar uh, plane. That single level datum will also wrap around uh, uh, along Lexington Avenue. We wanna make sure that that pedestrian scale follows you as you wrap around the site. It's not just on 42nd Street, but it exists on Lexington Avenue as well, uh, along with the public realm that's gonna be above it. Um, moving a little bit one scale up above the scale of the immediate pedestrian level, we also want to talk a little bit to you about the scale of the street and how as the tower bundles and creates this woven pattern before it, reach, it reaches the ground, um, it creates specific uh, relationships, specific scalar relationships, for example, to the statue of Mercury, uh, which you see here on the left, and to the upper cornice line of the terminal. And, and while we can argue that you know, these uh, exact alignments may not be perceptible to a pedestrian, uh, we know that they help create a scale at the, that is appropriate to the level of that streetscape, you know, to, to, to the level of, um, uh, of, of the street itself. Um, and moreover, once you overlay our building above, uh, above the terminal, you also see that that central figure, that central triangular figure, again, is of a similar scale, uh, you know, if, if not a little bit smaller to the scale of the terminal itself. And so those two things resonate with each other in terms of, um, of proportions, and, and we think that that creates harmony. Um, the terminal itself is characteristically Beaux-Arts in, uh, in that it deploys detail at multiple scales and it deploys ornament at multiple scales of detail. Uh, our building evidently has a very different approach to ornamentation. It's a contemporary building, it's, it's of its time. Uh, and yet we're, we are trying to bring in a level of detail at multiple scales. So from primary, uh, a distinction between primary and secondary columns uh, to architectural louvers that will come in and infill between uh, that woven pattern. And finally, to the texture of the columns that you've seen uh, in some of the previous renderings. So all of those things we think combine to create a very harmonious relationship between the terminal uh, and our building at the scale of the pedestrian and at the scale of the street. Uh, we think, uh, we think the, 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 the woven pattern of the structure, the hierarchy of architectural elements, uh, the, the particular attention we've paid to proportion and to detailing, and of course the symmetry of the tower itself and the way, for example, that those two staircases also echo the symmetry that you might find, for example, inside the terminal itself. We think all of these things come together uh, to create a harmonious dialogue between a building that is very contemporary, you know, that is of its time. Evidently, it's not trying to pretend to be uh, um, anything else, um, but that valorizes that landmark. 
Uh, another way that we think uh, value is really created here is through uh, the public terraces uh, and the publicly accessible open spaces that will wrap around uh, this tower on all sides in, th in 360 degrees. Uh, this is something that was discussed with the community board at previous, um, uh, at previous committee hearings. So I'm not gonna go into it in, in great depth, um, but I will say that uh, those will be publicly, will, will be accessible both via those grand staircases both on 42nd Street and on Lexington Avenue, uh, as well as through um, ADA elevators. Here you're seeing the intersection of our plinth with the Grand Central plinth. We've also paid a lot of attention to the detailing of how those two things come together in a way that doesn't confuse the old and the new, but that uh, extends the primary shadow line of that plinth. And so we've studied very carefully um, how to make sure that there's you know, some visual continuity, some acknowledgement of the, of the primary features of the plans, um, but no muddling of what's old and new. Uh, we're still looking to identify exactly what is the stone that we're going to use in our plinth, uh, but we know that it's gonna be somewhere within that range of the slightly pink uh, stony, uh, stony Creek granite, which is used in the plinth, and the maybe more neutral Indiana limestone that's used above in, in the body of the terminal itself. And so we're looking for a stone that's gonna be within that range and sympathetic with these. Once you take that elevator or that stair up uh, to what we now call the Grand Central Terrace, uh, a completely new urban space is revealed. And so this is where we are creating a uh, new value and really valorizing the Eastern facade of the terminal. This is a facade that has just as much detail as the 42nd Street facade, but that is largely concealed uh, to, to, I think, the average New Yorker. Uh, and even if you're driving by, you know, in a car, you might catch a glimpse of it, but you never really have an opportunity to experience it. So this elevated terrace will offer that opportunity. Uh, and uh, on the northern side of the terrace here, you see another set of stairs that will also help elevate you so that you can look down back towards uh, 42nd Street, uh, and, and further up that, that um, iconic elevation. Uh, we're working with uh, James Corner Field Operations. Uh, they're our landscape architect. And we're again, working to identify what is the best stone to use here, uh, but we're gonna be looking for one that complements the palette of the terminal. And we're also looking for geometries uh, that will draw from their context and kind of echo elements from their context, like these gently arching benches, for example, uh, and, 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 uh, and a particular scale to the scale of the paving and, and things of the sort. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to TJ Gottsdiener to quickly take us through uh, the tower design. Uh, thanks, Rami, and I'm a protege of Rami's at SOM. And I wanna step back and talk a little bit about some basic moves that we made. The first one obviously is, is the symmetry. And in order to sit comfortably next to Grand Central, we thought it very important like Grand Central that our building be symmetrical and it's symmetrical on both axes. Next. We also felt that the building like great, all great New York classic skyscrapers should set back. In our case, we've got a series of four successive tiers. And what this does among other things is to uh, preserve the light and air that gets down to the pedestrian level in the streets. Next. So, um, in addition to all that, as Rami mentioned, we did not see this as a flat glass building. In fact, we very much took that expression of the structure, which bundles down at the base and, and moves its way up and carried that to the exterior of the building. And that makes it a very unique building to New York, um, most places around the world actually, where all the columns are expressed on the exterior, not just in a flat manner, but these columns are outboard of the facade and they actually have some great depth, which will allow us to uh, see the light and shadow and the strength and, and almost a heroic nature to the building and give it some really great uh, materiality to the facade. And this, this um, lattice of columns extends right down from the base all the way up to the very top of the crown. Next. And as you see, we, we gave a lot of thought to the, the top of the crown. And, and like all great landmark buildings, New York buildings, it makes a very distinctive uh, feature on the skyline. In this case, uh, in, in a similar manner to how it bundles down at the base, it, 
works its way up and weaves itself together in uh, the top. And it gives a very soft feeling to the building, very much of it its time. And it really valorizes the design and its relationship to Grand Central. Thank you, TJ. Um, I'm gonna summarize everything that we've discussed on lot 30 because I know that it's a lot to digest before we move on to, to the lot one improvements. Um, so the building has a confident contemporary architectural expression. It's of its time, but it achieves the harmonious relationship with this balanced symmetrical massing. It's not hovering over the terminal. We're introducing a human single level plinth uh, that, that aligns with the plinth of the terminal. We've got a stone clad core uh, that again complements the Grand Central Terminal massing itself with this interplay of solids and voids, a compatible stone, uh, and it'll be visible through this largely transparent lobby you see on the right. We're maximizing the space between the building and the terminal at that viaduct level. Uh, we're tapering the form away from the property line and creating large transparent windows to, to bring in these new views that reveal the terminal to pedestrians. We're expressing the structural columns to bring relief and scale to the building. And finally, creating publicly accessible open spaces uh, that create new opportunities to finally appreciate the Eastern facade of the terminal and really valorize it to members of the public. Uh, as TJ said, it was very important to us that the massing of the building also steps back in successive tiers uh, so that it doesn't loom over, over the terminal. Uh, and I'm gonna take you through the second portion of our application here, which is improvements to Grand Central Terminal itself, so lot one. Those consist in two parts that I'm gonna go through. The first part is improvements at the viaduct level to the sidewalk. And the second part is improvements to uh, the retail storefronts within the 42nd Street passage. So the first one is exterior at the level of the viaduct. The second one is interior at the level of the ground floor. For the sidewalk improvements, uh, what we're discussing here is changes to the sidewalk within this developer easement area. So it's within lot one, but it's within this developer easement uh, between lot one and lot 30. These are some images of the site. Every, every, the grand height itself is, is lot 30. So everything within that is lot 30. Everything outside of that is lot one. And this small area that separates the viaduct proper uh, from what's often called Lower Depew Place and the drop-off area along our site is this uh, easement area. Uh, the orange line shows the current configuration of the sidewalk and in blue you see our proposal to extend uh, that sidewalk by 155 feet uh, and in pink you see our proposal our proposed uh, paving, paving improvement. And really the goal of the paving improvement here is to upgrade that sidewalk, um, as well as to, to, um, to use a finish that will be symp sympathetic with the finish we're gonna use on the plaza itself, which I just showed you, the Grand Central Plaza, uh, which is uh, within lot 30. So it's outside of this. Uh, there is a historical handrail that separates Lower Depew Place from the viaduct itself uh, that sits outside of lot one. So it sits, uh, uh, sorry, it sits outside of lot 30. Uh, so it's outside of our, our project, our development area. So it will be unaffected. Uh, and similarly, the historical viaduct uh, and its parapet are outside of our lot area. So those will remain unaffected as well. This is a quick bird's eye view of, of that area that we can return to if it, if it proves to be helpful. Um, I'm gonna go through the second portion of this, which is changes, interior changes to the retail areas within the 42nd Street passage. Um, on this side, you see um, you see uh, the plan from the interior designation, from the uh, the designation of the interior landmark within uh, within Grand Central, and in red you see the zone that we're discussing today, which is just adjacent to Lot 30, and is currently called um, uh, the 42nd Street Passage. Uh, the the state of that uh, of that area has changed dramatically since its original interior designation. Uh, and so it no longer looks like it looked uh, when it was designated. This is a plan of it in the 90s where you see some of the changes since the designation, in, including uh, a different connection to Vanderbilt Hall, uh, a ramp that replaced, uh, uh, sorry, a stair that replaced a ramp that used to descend to the lower concourse, uh, and a historic uh, 
uh, entrance that was blocked by an MTA elevator, which we're going to see a little bit later. Uh, and I think most most people looking at this plan would not recognize this as the current uh, uh, 42nd Street passage anyways. The current 42nd Street passage is really very much a result of Bayer Blinder Bell's Grand Central Master Plan that was in implemented in the late 90s. And this is a, a snapshot of that master plan that shows the implemented changes. So you're seeing that there are no longer ramps that split the passage in two. All of the width of the passage goes straight in and leads from the street to the main concourse, as you can see here. Uh, most importantly, the eastern part of that passage, so the part that uh, separates it from our site, from lot 30, was lined with retail. This was a, a major part of the master plan. Uh, and two other points of the master plan that I'm going to talk that I'm going to mention here are the opening up, of course, of the uh, what's called the oyster bar ramp that descends to the dining concourse, which is now a beloved part of the terminal, of course, as well as the recentering of the access from Vanderbilt Hall to 42nd Street Passage, so, so that it is symmetrical with the axis of Vanderbilt Hall itself. So those are those are two uh, other critical changes. Uh, some quick views that we can again return to later. On the left, you see the condition in the early 90s with this split, uh, the splitting of the ramps. And on the right side is the renovated condition that we know roughly as it is uh, today uh, with uh, the elimination of those ramps. Uh, this door here is the historic door that was blocked uh, at some point before the 90s bef uh, with an MTA elevator that descends to the mezzanine. This is the same point, but looking north on the left is before with the ramps and notice how um, that Eastern part of the passage would be unrecognizable to anybody today. On the right side is after the implementation of the master plan. And these are our current views that show, again, that Eastern wall uh, with that lining of retail that was created in the late nineties by Bayer Blinder Bell. So uh, this is the plan of the current condition, our proposal, um, entails the creation of a new transit hall. This is something that was presented at, um, uh, at a previous community board. Uh, uh, um, so I'm not gonna discuss it at length, uh, but I will say that the main purpose of the transit hall is to dramatically improve the level of service in this extremely congested uh, uh, subway entrance uh, as, as Jeff showed you earlier. And so we're moving all of the turnstiles up uh, to grade in order to liberate the mezzanine below, creating a new transit hall that will uh, 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 increase the capacity of this, of this uh, uh, subway. And we're relocating that MTA elevator that used to be in that third door that used to block the historical doors here into, uh, into our new expanded um, transit hall. The subway will also feature its own entrance independently from 42nd Street. So you no, no longer have to go inside the terminal uh, in order to get into the subway. So that will further help uh, con uh, contribute to decongest that entrance. Now, a very important uh, a metric, a very important goal here uh, that we've been working on with the MTA is to increase the porosity between the transit hall and uh, the rest of the terminal via the 42nd Street Passage. So what we are proposing here is to uh, remove two of the retail uh, stores that you see here, specifically and strategically in alignment with the oyster bar ramp and with the Vanderbilt Hall access. And I'm gonna show you uh, what that looks like in a little bit. This is a section through the current highly congested, slightly claustrophobic uh, subway entrance, subway access on the left. Uh, and this is a section through uh, our proposed condition. Above, you see the Grand Central Terrace, uh, which we spoke about earlier, that sits right above this transit hall. So all of this is within lot 30. This isn't within lot one. This, this isn't within the landmark. This is within our site. We're looking at the landmark beyond. But what's important here that I, that I want to mention is just the critical attention to um, alignments. So the, uh, uh, that new opening that we're proposing will align with the axis of, the, of uh, Vanderbilt Hall beyond, which this being a Beaux-Arts building also means that we're aligning with meaningful features such as this bullseye window, for example. The transit hall will be daylit uh, via the use of these skylights and with natural light also streaming in from 42nd Street through that entrance. So this is that view. Again, here we're within lot 30. We're not within the landmark. Uh, we're not within, uh, within Grand Central itself, but we're looking at Grand Central beyond. So you're seeing the access into Vanderbilt Hall beyond. 
you can see how we've strategically placed these skylights uh, and these openings in order to create these meaningful alignments. And we can return to these images um, as needed. So this is a, an elevation that shows you the location of these um, proposed changes within the, within, the, um, within the 42nd Street passage. This is the elevation of the Eastern side of the passage. Uh, and you're seeing one new opening in, uh, facing the Oyster Bar ramp, one new opening facing Vanderbilt Hall, and maybe one increase of uh, an existing opening uh, directly into the transit hall. And again, all of these, you know, the primary goal here is to increase the level of service, increase connectivity between that new expanded um, subway and the rest of the terminal. So this is a before and after view looking south towards 42nd Street, a before and after view looking north towards the rest of the terminal. And then again, looking south, but a little bit closer to the entrance. And this is that third door that is currently uh, blocked by an MTA elevator that we are proposing to relocate in order to restore this door to its original full width and its original historical condition. So that's our presentation. I know it's a lot to digest, but we're, we're here to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, so let's uh, go right to it. I would suggest that you actually keep your presentation up as uh, most likely the uh, questions will refer to uh, specific parts of it. Sure. Um, and uh, members of the committee, this is our chance to ask uh, questions. Please use the uh, raise hand uh, function um, if you have uh, questions. Questions from members of the committee. Uh, Tony, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Tony. Thanks, Leila. Um, I have two questions, actually. One is just referring to the 42nd Street um, restored entrance, the third bay that, uh, that's not been in use. The, um, when you say restored, the materials, uh, they're going to be matching the original two bays that are still intact. Are they all bronze? Uh, they are not, they are not bronze. Actually, they are currently, uh, I believe painted, uh, and I think, sorry, I, no more than I can jump in. Yeah, I was looking for my mute button. They are, um, painted cast iron and, uh, it would be done exactly as we did on the, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, ramp where half had been built over, uh, in the uh, 1970s into what had been a, a shoe store and then a FedEx shop. We uh, went uh, to a historic uh, iron um, and metalwork uh, uh, refurb refurbisher, and we completely rebuilt exactly from the original architectural drawings uh, that second half of that new entrance on Vanderbilt. We would do the same here uh, with exactly the same materials, the rivets, the uh, painted cast iron would be uh, exactly as originally built. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, my, my second question has to do with, um, with lighting, uh, will the crown be lit up and will there be any lighting at all on the lower floors? So that's a great question. Um, we are still working through the lighting scheme for the building. Um, so that'll be detail that we'll be able to share in the future. But it's a, it's a good question and something that we're very focused on. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Kayback. Yeah, um, I just wanted to know if the height has been determined. The last uh, meeting we had, uh, there were two different heights discussed. Has the height been finalized of the building? Emma, I have two questions. So the height, no, the, the height hasn't been finalized yet. As, um, as you know, under the scoping, we're studying about a 1600 foot um, height for the building. Um, Rami, I believe the, the building that's shown here may be slightly less than that, but it hasn't been finalized yet. My second question, thank you, is uh, the dimensions of those support uh, pillars that will be holding up the building. They look uh, pretty large. What, do you have the, uh, how about the, the diameter? Um, we, can, we can follow up with that, but I can tell you that we've been working very, very hard to make sure that they're no bigger than they need to be. Um, every single one of these columns, every, I mean, for, for really, every single one of these columns um, is load bearing. Uh, and they're really only as big as they need to be because evidently we don't want the lobby to turn into um, a, a very large cluster of columns. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Richard, ma'am. Richard, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was unclear. What, what's the external material of the columns? They're they're going to be clad in a in a metal panel. So you're seeing so the stru there's a, the structural element is inside, and then you're we're cladding the structure in a metal panel. Well, what color? Yeah. The specific color we're going to continue to look at. We haven't exactly selected the color. What you're looking at right now, we think, is very close uh, to what we would like it to be. So a very neutral, a very neutral color. We don't want it to look uh, too blue or too garish. Uh, the goal being with using metal is that it, you know it'll it'll pick up a little bit of the color that's around it instead of uh, sort of dominating with its own with its own really strong color. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Karen. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a couple questions about the materiality chosen for expressing the guardrails and handrails and um, this, this diamond screen between the structural columns. I'm wondering if that's glass or is it open you know, to the wind and to the elements? And if you could talk a little bit about the um, elevator that we see in this rendering, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, how you thought about the modern expression of a lot of these um, materials such as glass and metal. So, Jeff, I'm taking that. Go ahead, Ronnie. Um, so, as you said, these are modern materials, um, and and again, you know, this this is a tower that's going to be very much of of its time. So, it's, it's going to use contemporary materials. Uh, the screen that you're seeing, sort of expressed between um, between the primary structure, for example, in these little lozenge shapes, uh, this is going to be uh, a metal screen that sits proud of the glass. This is how we're currently imagining it. Um, and then the glass will be behind it. Uh, what you're seeing here on the right side is a cable net uh, wall glass. So this is a glass wall, but that has very, very minimal, very refined detailing because it's being held, uh, held in tension. Um, as for the ADA elevator, we're currently imagining it to be a glass elevator. The primary purpose of this elevator is to uh, be clearly visible. So even though it is glass, the goal, you know, the goal is for it to be visible enough that if anybody can't use the stairs, it's very clear that the that the elevator is is right there for their use in order to rise up to the uh, to the terrace. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe flip to the rendering that shows um, the pedestrian uh, level with? where there's some glass guardrails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then along, going to the north axis along Vanderbilt. Like is, is that solid glass? I know this is a detail, but are there metal, metal handrails? Um, so as you can see here, the, our, our, our current thinking um, is that really the main uh, solid profile here is this lower portion. The guardrail itself is glass, and its height uh, is it's, is such that it, it uh, aligns with the with the profile of the plinth itself and, and, and the plinth's kind of parapet. And then behind that, you get the actual um, guardrail. You get the actual handrail itself, which you see here is a very thin uh, metal handrail. I see. Mm -hmm. And um, a follow-up question. Was there any precedent for landscaping or trees at that level before along that? There are cars that run along that level where the tree is, correct? Uh, that's correct. Was, was there always um, landscape there? There is currently no landscape there. Again, as a reminder, the, the current building sits out here. Ah, right? okay, that's and right. I think, right. and I know it's kind of hard to imagine because, because we're, we never actually go up there. It's so rare that unless you're getting dropped off by a, a car, taxi, yeah. Mm -hmm. go up there. <laughs> but it's always, it's really valuable to remember that the current building is sitting out here and we're pulling our building away from the property line. We're pulling our building away from the terminal in order, in order yeah, to create it, that really a, space. Yeah, no, you're right. And it's really an area that pedestrians have never been, and the public have really never been able to experience before. And, an opportunity we saw to really open up an entirely new perspective on the terminal. And obviously we're being very thoughtful and working um, with James Corner um, on, on how to best program that space and, and the plantings and vegetation, et cetera, that'll work best there. 
And yeah. James Corner is the same um, landscape architect who designed the High Line. And so they're very experienced in being able to put, uh, you know, really healthy trees uh, with real, you know, the room they need for the bulbs and the room they need for, the, for their roots to actually thrive, even though they're not, you know, at grade, even though they're elevated. Mm -hmm. A kind of a technical question. Does, does this pedestrian landscaped um, corridor contribute or count towards the improvement part of Grand Central? Uh, so the, the public realm spaces that you see on the west side of the building and on the north side of the building mm -hmm. are considered public realm improvements uh, under the special permits. And then the east side of the building is um, uh, another area that goes towards the 10,000 square foot requirement for open space as part of the project. And this whole concept I should mention of elevating these spaces is something, it's actually an idea that came from Gail Brewer when we first talked to her about the project, but it really gave us an opportunity given the constraints at the site with all the transit infrastructure um, and uses at the ground to really think about how we could open this up and create kind of this great space around the building. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on to uh, Renee Kefaro. Renee, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask if there was any plan for where signage would be and if there's someone committed as a tenant or have a plan for if there is someone in future that's tenant that would get, you know, marquee top of the uh, of the building signage, you know, Tony's question on lighting kind of reminded me of that is, you know, what else can possibly be distracting the eye? Um, and that was the, you know, just general signage master plan. So with respect to signage, that's something that we'll be working through on all of these public spaces with um, city planning and others as part of the York process and developing a signage plan. Uh, as to the top of the building, I don't know if David Karnofsky, our council, is on. He might be able to answer that for you. Yeah, well, it, yes, hi. Um, top of the building signage is not really permitted, and um, we don't have any plans to, to do that. Uh, and uh, we've discussed the lighting uh, previously, which is different. Thank you. Renee, do you have any follow-up? Um, not really. Um, I think I, I'll reserve my rest of my things to comments. I don't really know what else to, to ask, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara Spendorf. Barbara, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, just to follow up on the, these public terraces, they will always be for the public? There's no chance yes, to ever be reverted back to just the building use? So, so these spaces that you see on the slide are contemplated to be public spaces and we've been working very closely with city planning on um, the programming and design of those. And, and actually they've evolved over time. We started with terraces on the west and the east and have now added a terrace on the north as well. But there, is there any guarantee that these will always be public? Uh, so as part of the special permit process, for which we receive, you know, the associated bonuses for the project, these will remain public spaces. Okay. And I, I actually have, a, I've been up on that level because I bicycle through the, um, you know, the roadway. Um, and is, is there going to be a barrier between the road and these plazas? Or bollards, or I mean, because cars. Uh, maybe Rami can speak to that. I have to. I I will just say I'm impressed that you ride your bike on the viaduct up there. That's um, quite uh, yeah, adventurous. Yeah, only on the other But yeah. <laughs> um, Rami, do you know whether what kind of um, bollards or other design elements will be between the road and the public space? We are we are coordinating coordinating this very closely. Uh, with uh, uh, with uh, NYPD counterterrorism and other agencies, we are currently anticipating that yes, there will be bollards here. 
um, and there will also be a, a lay-by lane that will separate, uh, uh, you know, the main traffic lane from uh, the lay-by lane of the cars, creating a little bit more separation as well. Rami, maybe you could point out the bollards in the rendering because they're pretty innocuous. Sorry, yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. We, you know, they're usually very garish. We, we've tried our best to make them look <laughs> a little bit inconspicuous here. Uh, yeah. But we will continue to coordinate their design. This is an element that we will, I, I'm sure, continue to review, uh, you know, as this process develops. This is not the last we're going to see of these bollards. Yeah, why don't you remove the, your drawing now so you can see it without it. There you go. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yeah, Suzanne Johnson. Suzanne, go ahead. Hi, um, I had a question about... Um, any identification of the original Commodore uh, Hotel that was there from 1919? Are you going to do, um, you, you use word like sympathetic and harmonious and so forth. And um, those are, those are good, lang you know, good language to use in the context of this presentation. And I just wondered if there was any acknowledgement of what was there historically and if you're going to do any kind of signage or um, any memorial or any anything contextually that would bring people back to what was there originally and sadly gone. Jeff, it, um, I, I, Rami or maybe Frank, do you want to touch on that? Uh, I think it's an an interesting question and something we can think yeah. about some more. But sure. you know, Donald Trump basically. I think took took care of the Commodore Hotel. Yeah, Frank, you want right. to jump in? No, let's. Yeah, I don't. Donald, I think you're Donald right. Time. <laughs> and 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 Suzanne, you're right. You know, we're 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 also. Um, uh, I think you know you have it. You make a good point about memorializing what was there and and how it was gone. Uh, in our conversations with Shippo, they were very interested in uh, at the separation between the lot one and lot thirty line. They want to make sure that there's a slight change in the size of the pavement, for example, or some mm -hmm. sort of a detail like that, that actually uh, memorializes where th the location uh, of the old Commodore Hotel, which would be essentially somewhere out here. We haven't fully fled, you know, fleshed out these kinds of details, but that, that's, that was one request from Shippo about um, just physically manifesting you know, where was the boundary of that, of that hotel, since our building, again, will sit away from that. And so you won't even be able to say that it's there. So I think that's that's kind of the only point where it, where it came up. But um, you, you raise an interesting point. Yeah, there will I mean, be ways to experience it. I mean, as well. I mean, the the, the Lexington Passage will remain. It will be reinterpreted and redesigned. But uh, part of the way that one experienced the Commodore originally was part of this larger system of circulation. You know, as one passed through Grand Central into one of the many passageways out to the streets. So there still will be that. Uh, we've also have a program within Grand Central. You know, we have uh, in the main. Uh, what we call the Jackie Onassis uh, foyer. We've created a place where we have a uh, history of the building, you know, in uh, imagery and in text. Uh, it's a part now of um, all of the tours which have gone, you know, totally digital now um, uh, that people can take. So there are key places throughout the entire site, not just the building proper. So there are many ways of, you know, interpreting and preserving all of that history for people who are interested in it. Or a historic marker, perhaps. We're, Absolutely. We're going yep. to have to to move on. I, I don't want to you know spend too much time because we have a lot yet to cover. So um, you know m maybe we can uh, move on to to the next question if that's okay with you, Suzanne. Um, I see that lots of hands are up. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Nick. Uh, Nick Germer, go ahead with your question. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I think back in the previous slide where you showed the Gillards um, and the terrace. So my question is. You know, is there a way to enter the Grand Central Terminal from the terrace? And and my question is you, that you have that road going across. So will will tourists know that they can't really cross the road to go anywhere? And I think I'm kind of asking this as like, will there be a wall or do we expect kind of what you show in the image? Just how will people, how will tourists know I can't really go anywhere. I can't get into the terminal from here and I shouldn't be crossing the street with all these cars. Have you thought about that? Mm -hmm. So I think, that's, I think that's a good question and something that um, 
James Corner certainly will be focused on along with, with SOM um, in terms of the design. Um, as Rami mentioned, there will be a lay-by-lane there as well, and I think it'll be fairly evident as to um, the traffic patterns and, and so on. Um, Rami, do you have anything to add there? Um, I will just add um, that, again, we are, you know, modifying the sidewalk only up to a certain level, and I think there's going to be a very clear, currently there's going to be a very clear uh, line at which you will no longer cross. You know, I think there's maybe what what we want to try to do with this project is, again, valorize this whole site by making sure that there's maybe a future, a carless future in 50 years, in 100 years, who knows? Where, where that level actually does become inhabitable comfortably, right? Like what if there was a future in the future where, where, where you, you could actually walk along that viaduct, you know, um, the way that some people now bike there on their weekends. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? So, but I think that that's a future proposition. And I think we, we understand your current concern about that, that boundary condition there and, and uh, you know, making sure people are safe. And, and as to your question about uh, direct access from this, terrace down to the terminal. Uh, no, there, there is no direct access. Basically, you know, if you're here and you want to go down into the terminal, you have to take the stair down or you have to take the, you know, the elevator down and then go into the terminal from the sidewalk. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen, uh, you have your hand up. Do you have uh, follow-up questions? Yes, quick question. Um, I understand the scale and the materials at the at the pedestrian level up close. Could you show an elevation from 42nd Street that gives us an idea of geometry, geometries and scale and some of the materials adjacent to Grand Central kind of zoomed out? I think you had that at the beginning, right, Rami? Um, something like this. This is probably not very color accurate. It's a little bit de desaturated, but it gives you a sense of what's stone mm -hmm. versus what's uh, what's mm -hmm. not, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and this is probably the most accurate representation, really, of how those materials are coming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. I just wanted to take another look. If you could just go back again, I gotta ingrain it in my brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions uh, from members of the committee? Um, I think that Peter Stenberg had a question. I just want to make sure that um, I think he's having issues finding the race hand uh, function. But Peter, do you have a question for, uh, for the applicant? Yeah, the question was just uh, how much additional building volume are you getting in exchange for the plazas? Sorry, it was a little hard to hear the last one. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. How much additional building volume are you getting in exchange for the open plazas? How much bigger building? Uh, so, so the special permits that we're receiving, which cover both the transit and the public realm aspects um, that we talked about here and in prior presentations are about 770,000 square feet. I would say that's an estimate at the moment. We're still working through the details with city planning, but that's approximately what we would expect. Thank you. And, and the, the, just to make it clear, the calculation is a uh, FAR bonus, uh, Jeff, that's correct. And uh, correct. You're, you're seeking between two and three uh, bonus FAR yep. for, for this uh, element. That's correct. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, Leila. Uh, is is there, is that clear to to everybody? I know that we don't really deal with FAR as much as we do um, at uh, land use. Just want to make sure that it is clear and that, or you know, if, if everybody uh, understands that. Okay, looks like uh, we do. Um, I have a couple of questions of my own. Uh, the first one, which is more of a technical question. So, if I understand correctly. Uh, this is a lot merger, and this is uh, through a lot merger that the available air rights from Grand Central Terminal are being shifted to the uh, development site. Does that mean that um, the merged lot becomes under the jurisdiction of LPC? 
Uh, this is David, David Karnowski. Do yeah. you want to take that? Yes. Go ahead. LPC's jurisdiction is will remain with respect to lot one, which is the landmark lot identified in the landmark designation. So a lot, a lot merger does not uh, give LPC any further jurisdiction. No, it does not. And 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 as you know, it's 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 um, it's more that it's going to be defined as a qualifying site that includes both lot one and lot 30. But again, lot one will remain the landmark site. Right, and that's the, and you know, but the harmonious relationship report obviously gives LPC, um, so much. you know, purview in, in looking at the building and the relationship to Grand Central. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my um, next question is, um, I may have been misunderstood um, or mistaken. Um, you mentioned that there's a sidewalk that is being enlarged and I want to make sure that I understood correctly. Is it the sidewalk at grade level on 42nd Street or is it the sidewalk that is bounding your building to the west between uh, your building and uh, the terminal? It's a, it's a couple of sidewalks. Rami, you want to walk through it? Sure. Let me just um, maybe quickly show the plan. Um, and so there is a sidewalk. Um, the sidewalk is being widened um, along the entirety of the eastern side, so along Lexington Avenue. Um, along 42nd Street, there's a widening of the sidewalk, uh, you know, that might not technically speaking count as a, as a si sidewalk widening, but you are widening the sidewalk underneath the plinth uh, in these locations, as well as in the middle uh, uh, by about 17 feet where the actual entrance of the building will be. And what that, you know, manifests into in um, in person is it means that you're widening the sidewalk everywhere except for where the stair landings are. Uh, so this whole zone here underneath, uh, you know, underneath these stairs is widened by uh, five feet. Right, so it's widened on Lexington, it's widened on 42nd, and then obviously above, uh, adjacent to the viaduct, we're stepping back to introduce the Grand Central Terrace as well, which while not technically a sidewalk, you know, is, is that public access we've spoken about. Okay, okay, got it. Um, then my other question is, um, have you done any study as to impact of your tower on uh, the Chrysler building and the view corridors? So uh, Rami, do you wanna go? Do you wanna take that? Um, Sure, we are. Sure, I'm happy to. It, it was that was also a comment that was raised, um, of course, as part of the, the um, EIS and the EIS conversations. I think everybody's evidently very curious about that. So, you know, we're developing these views um, uh, as to how this will interact with views of, uh, of the Chrysler building. Uh, you know, this wasn't so much the topic of the harmonious relationship, and that's why for this presentation, we're really focusing on the relationship specifically to the terminal. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, but have you had any conversations with LPC on uh, the relationship between the tower and uh, the, the um, Chrysler building? They, they have um, not commented. So, go, go ahead, Rami. They, they have not commented um, specifically on, on, the, on the relationship to Chrysler yet. Um, and do you, do you know if the um, Chrysler owner has any views? Um, we've not um, met with the Chrysler owner specifically about the project, but it's certainly something in the future, you know, that um, we can do. Um, just to go back to Rami's point though, and, you know, I think in terms of the, the interaction with LPC, um, they'll see um, similar materials to what we are um, presenting tonight um, to you all. Um, and, you know, we've been very focused on making sure that we, um, we get the base of this building right, you know, and that the relationship with Grand Central we figure out. And that's really been the focus of the harmonious relationship report. Um, but obviously we'll continue to interface with everyone moving forward. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I have no further questions, uh, members of the committee, any uh, lingering questions that you may have? Okay, seeing none, I will open up to uh, members of the public um, and members of the public elected officials or uh, members of the board who are not uh, members of this committee. Uh, this is the time for you to ask your uh, questions. I think that um, Dave Achilles um, had his hand up. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just a little confused about the public terrace. It's an improvement to the public realm, which is that part of your incentive zoning on which you're hoping to get the extra two or 300 feet for? The, the terrace on the west side as well as the terrace on the north side are part of the public or the uh, special permit um, uh, improvements that we'll receive during the UR and associated bonus. Okay, so if we don't by any chance uh, pass the scope and you don't get the special permits, we won't get that public walkway. I'd say we, we think about all of the improvements of the package together and I think that's how city planning and, and others think about it. Um, I guess we haven't really broken it apart in that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I see that Sarah Dawson has her hand up. Um, if she can be allowed to talk and then Sarah, you can ask your question. Sarah, do you have a question? Sarah, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Um, with um, the public, um, maybe uh, mothers with carriages and uh, people with wheeled suitcases, do you need more ramps to get people you know, people can use stairs or an elevator, but are more ramps needed for people to access these spaces? Uh, it's a great question. And Rami, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the considerations around the terraces and obviously the elevator access we provided as well on both sides of the building? That's right. So we, we've provided um, elevator access on both sides of the building so that there's enough redundancy there that you can access, you know, either side. Uh, it's extremely difficult to eliminate stairs uh, and rise up exclusively via ramps uh, to that upper level. Uh, and so while we were able to do that inside, inside the transit hall, our transit hall is, is a completely ramped space, you know, uh, which is how Grand Central is designed, as you point out, that's what we all love about Grand Central. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do that for uh, the public open spaces that surround the building. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any more questions from uh, members of the public? Um, Dave, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, I'm sorry, one very quick question. The building is so tall and so massive, uh, what about shadow studies? Have there been any shadow studies done on what this huge building is going to do to the neighborhood? Yeah, so that was a comment that I think the community board um, submitted as part of the scoping. And so that's something that we'll be looking at during the environmental review. Thank you. Do you have a sense of when the um, environmental uh, impact statement will be uh, completed? So our, our timeline, our, our expectations that we'll be certifying into UORP in the spring, Layla, in terms of the completion of the, the next round of environmental, David, do you want to opine on that? I think the, the answer uh, is essentially the spring um, and uh, not too long before a certification. So I can't say much more than that. We're working hard at it, but as you know, it's a very extensive uh, piece of work. For sure. Um, thank you. Um, any further uh, questions? Uh, yes, from members of the public. Um, Uxin, um, Emily, 
You had your hand up. Do you wish to ask a question? Okay, it looks like not. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, Scott McQueenie. Scott, you're allowed to, we're going to allow you to talk and you can ask your question. Make sure you unmute yourself. Scott, you are, uh, can someone permit Scott to speak? No, Leila, I'm having trouble doing that. Can you see his hand raised and click on that? For some reason, I cannot. Okay, let me see if I can. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, uh, Scott, you're permitted to uh, to speak. Thank you, Thank you Marisa. Um, more of a comment, uh, Lexington Avenue. Can, can you actually, really, Scott, can you introduce yourself and oh, sure. um, if you have any affiliations that you want to mention? Uh, no particular affiliation, uh, but spend a lot of time in the area, uh, business, and used to live in Tudor City. Uh, the Lexington Avenue side could really benefit from significant widening of the sidewalk, is my only comment. It looks like it's very little width being added. Okay, thank you. Um, team of applicants, I don't know if you want to address that. I know it's not exactly germane to the application. Um, uh, ha happy to, Leila. And uh, as Rami mentioned, we will be um, expanding the sidewalk on the Lexington side. I think it's about a 50% increase in width, maybe a little less than that from what the existing sidewalk is. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from uh, members of the public? Any other questions? Okay, seeing, oh yeah. Uh, Michael Benabib. And you are permitted to speak, Michael, go ahead. Uh, Michael, do you have a question? We cannot hear you, Michael. Okay, so it looks like we are having difficulty hearing uh, Michael. I'm not sure if uh, he has a question. Any other questions from uh, members of uh, the public? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm unsure if Michael has difficult technical difficulties or does not wish to um, speak anymore. Uh, At this point, he has to unmute himself. He can unmute if he, if he wants to, but I can't do it for him. But he's able to unmute if he wants to. So Michael, you're muted, so we cannot hear you. You are permitted to speak. And if you have a question, you can go ahead. Okay, it looks like Michael is unmuted and we cannot hear him. Um, okay, I, I am sorry, Michael, but we cannot hear you. Um, maybe there's a way for you to um, reboot your, your, um, your system. Um, but at the moment we cannot hear you and unfortunately we have to, uh, to move on. Um, if you are able to uh, figure out this technical glitch, um, I will certainly reopen up um, the floor so that you can ask uh, your question. Um, any other questions from other members of the public? Okay, so seeing none and uh, given that we haven't been able to figure out this technical glitch with uh, Michael, um, I'm gonna ask one more time, members of the committee, do you have any uh, further questions? Um, if, yeah, I see someone has his head up. Um, Michael, Michael K. Back, go ahead. Yeah, just on this slide number 35 that's up right now, uh, is that stairway or is that escalator? I can't discern just how that ramp or whatever uh, is getting people up and down. 
on uh, that uh, stairs. I see stairs. Looks kind of steep. Okay. There. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps that's clear. Yeah. Uh, and we've made sure to have, you know, we're working very, very closely with uh, DCP and PDC to make sure that we have very ample landings here so that the stair isn't um, uh, kind of intimidating and that you have a chance to rest there. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, any more questions, members of the committee? Okay, so seeing none, uh, we're all going to move to business session. As I said, during business session, only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter. Members of the public and applicants are no longer um, allowed to speak unless recognized by the chair. So uh, please use the raise hand uh, function. Uh, we need uh, comments uh, from uh, members of uh, the uh, committee. And I think that uh, Renee Kefaro had some comments. Renee, I'm gonna call. I, I did, and I was looking for the, the raised hand function for some reason, I was having trouble with it. Um, I, I'm not sure where I start, uh, but wow. Um, you know, in their presentation, they really focused on, you know, how the design is cutting away from the street wall. So for, well, we able to see more of the, the landmark and that's supposed to be a big, um, you know, gold star for them. Unfortunately, they glossed over the fact that my eye cannot look at anything but their entrance. Um, I think it's a mess. I think it's not contextual. I think it detracts from the landmark. Um, you know, I, I think that the fenestration being sort of that diamond shape, plus on top of it, we've got those very confusing pillars. Um, it's, it's just the entryway. I mean, I was, gonna, I, I was gonna ask the question, like would they be willing to completely scrap the concept of the bottom of their building? Uh, but I would presume that the answer to that is no. Um, but I really feel that what you gain in that small corner of ability to see uh, Grand Central, you immediately lose uh, with this uh, confusing, uh, non-contextual, um, overly modern design that um, even though they kept saying things like it's reflecting and it's contextual and it's respectful of, of, the, uh, of the Grand Central next to it, I didn't see it. I didn't see how it was related. Um, you know, I, I was against uh, one Vanderbilt as well uh, for similar reasons. And I find this even more distracting than that. Um, and I, I just, I really could not see how this is appropriate and um, would really love to see something else that doesn't um, overwhelm one of the most important buildings in New York City. Thank you, Renee. Uh, just for a little bit of context, um, you know, I just want to explain a little bit what this um, harmonious relationship report uh, exactly is. Um, so, uh, actually, the first time I, I reviewed an application uh, for uh, a harmonious report, um, I actually went online and, you know, I just Googled uh, harmonious relationship and I just got pages and pages and pages of marriage counseling. <laughs> so, and, you know, it, I, it made me laugh at the time, but I think it's, it's actually a very good analogy. Um, in essence, the newcomer has to be harmonious and sympathetic to the existing landmark. And uh, there has to be, it, it has to be a good marriage. You know, you cannot have, uh, you know, a, a building that is so drastically different. And uh, so that, that is really the, the notion that, you know, that needs to be established. And, you know, this report is uh, issued by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, which is why we, we get to, uh, to opine. Uh, but, you know, typically what makes a good uh, harmonious building is a building that defers to the landmark, you want you know you want the landmark to shine, um, and you you want a uh, you know you want the, the new building to pay homage uh, to the the existing building, which which is not to say that you know it has to be a pastiche, uh, but you know just to give a little bit of context that this is what um, harmonious uh, is deemed in in the text and in you know previous cases. 
Uh, so continuing on with uh, comments, uh, I see that uh, Suzanne has her hand up. Suzanne, go ahead. Um, I, I was just going to um, say that I 100% agree, not only with you, but also with Renee. Again, in my question, I brought to light some of the embedded uh, vocabulary that was used, like the words like sympathetic or visual continuity. And I just, honestly, I applaud their efforts, but I do not feel like it does that. I think that it completely overshadows that which they're supposed to work in contextually with. But also they use the word, so that aside, I wanted to just say, yes, I agree with that. Um, and that this notion of preserving light and air, I don't, I, we didn't really expound on that. And that's sort of a larger thing contextually. And I know they're going to speak to the environmental impact of this, but that's a huge element of this also. And I think the escalation of the population of the amount, you know, the people that will be coming to this area and the overwhelming uh, demands of such a massive building, um, you know, and all of the areas that they have created for this, you know, utilizing um, outdoor space is going to be just an absolute beehive. Um, and I'm not sure that these things are congruent, and I have big concerns about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Buzz, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Buzz. But Buzz, you're, you're muted. muted. Buzz, we cannot hear you. Okay. Buzz, you sorry, 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 I, wrong button. Um, I just wonder though, again, the problem is it's a big building. And in the very beginning of the presentation, they showed the only way they could support such a huge building uh, is by these huge two foundations in the front of the building. So, as long as they want to build a huge building, uh, this problem remains. Uh, the Vanderbilt Hotel didn't have that, uh, the Commodore Hotel didn't have that problem because it wasn't a huge building. So it's a, it's a very, very fundamental question. I'm not sure what other approach they can do. I mean, technically what they're doing, it, it was made, the point was made right in the beginning of bringing down with those pipes or whatever they, whatever they look like, uh, the load bearing structure of the building onto those two points. So uh, I'm not sure what their alternative is. Uh, well, I would, um, I would say Buzz. And that's, uh, that's, that, that's my question. We, is we the architecture, are, I'm going to finish my question. My question is the architecture and the design based solely on that, uh, or are there uh, other ways to do it? Okay, so you know, just to be clear with um, everybody, we are you know obviously not in a position to redesign an entrance. Um, I trust that you know SOM is an incredibly talented architectural firm, and um, you know the design that they're proposing is of very high quality. But those are not the questions that are in front of us. The question that is in front of us is whether this design is harmonious with uh, the, the terminal. And, and that's my question. My question, my question is, is, uh, is a harmonious design possible uh, given the there is engineering issues? Is, is not the question that is in front of us. The question that is in front of us is, do we believe that this current design that was presented to us is harmonious to Rent Central Terminal? I think everyone that's, says that's, no, that's, but uh, that that's the question, and those well, are. The I'll say no if that's what you want. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, let's see, uh, Barbara. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, well, just to follow up what uh, Buzz just said. I mean, you know what. Without designing, I speak as an architect, without designing the building for them, there's never one way to design a building. I mean, it, it, I think that they've made a very convincing argument for why they did what they did, but you could give the same problem to any number of firms and they would approach it differently. Um, I, I agree with some of the other comments that were made. Um, I mean, I think that, there's a lot of language, and I, I think that they they tried to connect certain de not design elements, and even as the architect, you know, design elements of the new building, you know, with Grant's 
with Grand Central, um, and I think even the architects alluded to the fact that some of these relationships really wouldn't even be perceived by people. And I think as an architect, those are sort of design kind of games that you play to sort of play with scale and, and make connections. Um, and, and I would say that it is, um, it, it really, as other people have said, I, I find um, the expression of this tower extremely overwhelming. I, I don't have any problem with modern buildings at all. I wouldn't expect this to be anything but a, a modern building. However, the expression of it is just uh, really, really overwhelms the scale aside, just the expression of the of the building elements, I think really overwhelm um, uh, the historic um, building that it sits next to. Um, and even creating these, um, hum you know, these tie-ins with the plinth um, doesn't really ameliorate um, those aspects. So um, I, I would agree with uh, some of the other comments by Renee and Suzanne that it, it really um, uh, it does not uh, create a harmonious uh, relationship with uh, Grand Central. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Tony. Thanks, Layla. Um, I completely agree with Barbara. I mean, I'm a big fan of modern buildings and New York's really got to step up its game when it comes to modern architecture. But this, of course, is a very unique parcel, of course, because it has to create a relationship with a beautiful landmark. Um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by the, uh, the improvements to the uh, pedestrian flow in and out of the terminal to get to the transit halls. I think that's fantastic and we desperately need a lot of help there. Um, I think they did a great job with that. Um, I do have concerns with a relationship that's being established. I do uh, agree with Renee who pointed out, seeing the 42nd Street uh, entrance to this building, it just, the diagonal staircases at the main 42nd Street entrance just pull your eye to this building. Everything about this building, especially the lower levels, should really nod to Grand Central. My eye goes straight to that center lobby, which it's beautifully done, but this has to create a, uh, a complementary relationship with Grand Central, and I don't think it does. And, and furthermore, it's got the glass, um, I, I forget what he called it, but the netting that encases the lobby. There's another diagonal line inside of there, which are the escalators in the lobby. That too, it throws off, in my eye, it throws off just seeing too many lines. Of course, suppose our design doesn't have a lot of these uh, shapes going in every which way, but the fact that they're funneling your focus to this building and not to the landmark, I think is a big problem. Um, the glass elevator on the 42nd Street facade, I think that also pulls your eye away. It's, it's oddly placed right at the edge. Um, going back to the staircase, the fact that we have such a large break in the street wall on 42nd Street is a big concern of mine as well. 42nd Street should have a continuous street wall, in my opinion. Grand Central did it. Um, it's a wall of retail coming all the way across. I, I find that that break, uh, and I know that they connected it and it, it slopes downward from there. They did a you know, decent job kind of, uh, I guess, with the connection. But again, it's a very large break. It's not just an opening into the building. It's a very large break in the street wall, which again, funnels your eye inward. You just, you can't, you can't avoid it. Um, you know, these are all things in my mind, uh, or my eye at least, they detract from the landmark itself. And if we're trying to define a harmonious relationship, this all goes against it, in my opinion. Um, I love that they're trying to bring in the limestone. I think they absolutely should on the lower levels, especially. I think a lot of it is going to be getting uh, hidden kind of because it, so much of it is tucked back in that central column behind the glass facade. Uh, I think that they should probably try to utilize that a little bit more. And then the lighting, um, not so much the crown, but any lighting on the lower level, the stairs, the pedestrian plazas up top, one level up, those will all be lit. The lower two to three floors of the lobby are all glass. That'll be one giant lantern. And although it'll look beautiful, I'm sure, again, your eye straight to that building. I think it's going to pull away from a, a Grand Central that's so softly and beautifully lit. Um, and, you know, these are just kind of adding up as to all the reasons that, you know, we're not complementing 
uh, a harmonious relationship with, with Grand Central. I think it's a problem. Thank you, Tony. And uh, I see that Renee has uh, her hand up. Renee, do you have a follow-up comment? I, I did have a follow-up comment. Um, Tony stole my thunder a little bit about <laughs> the detraction at night. Um, you know, right now we do need to also remember not to detract uh, from the, the landmark and to be respectful of the landmark at night right now. You know, obviously it's a, a crown jewel of park um, being uh, uplit. And so if you do have the sort of lantern effect, as you said, that will draw your eye even to that. But I wanted to also pull together, you know, wrap up all these comments in a, in a bow. We got a little distracted by, you know, well, can they do anything else with the design? Um, architecturally aside, obviously, I mean, I, I live around all of the, those massive super towers on 57th Street. You clearly can support a massive building um, in different ways. And that actually just bolsters my point even more that they need to reconsider the base of this building. Perhaps these crazy columns are the only way they can support a building that size with the cutaway or whatever that they're doing with that, but perhaps they need to do something simpler. Some of the other skyscrapers, you know, it's not about being glass. This isn't a taste committee. I know I've said that for 10 years, it's not about personal taste. It's about, you know, it could be a modern building, but it needs to be respectful. And this is far too confusing to be next to, uh, next to Grand Central. So there's definitely better ways and we have better options even that we see within the neighborhood, within our own community board um, of how you can have these massive buildings, which I don't particularly care for, but that's besides the point, um, that are more respectful to what's next to it in the street wall. Yeah, th thank you, Renee. And uh, I think that Peter Stenberg has a comment. Peter, go ahead. I think we're all mortified by the volume of the building, by the masses there, but I don't think that's our purview. I have a sort of dissenting opinion. I think the concept and the execution is actually quite masterful. The way that they're exposing the east side of Grand Central is a huge gift to the city and to anybody who will be coming by there. I think the columns are exquisite in the way that they reflect the columns of Grand Central. I think the color of the columns and the decision to make them Silver is a nod. I mean, one thing that just drives me crazy in New York is the way that the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building are being subsumed, and this is going to go far toward doing that. But if there's going to be some humongous building next to the Chrysler Building, I think that this is actually sort of a beautiful nod to the Chrysler Building. And also just remembering that the two of the most loathed structures when they were first built of the 20th century were the Chrysler Building and the Eiffel Tower. Remembering how much Chrysler was hated when it was built and how it became the most beloved building in the city. This building has an extraordinary relationship to that with the diagonals and with the forms. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Um, any more comments from uh, members of the committee? Okay, so seeing none, I will um, share uh, my comments. Um, so I concur with uh, the majority of uh, those who made comments. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the building is, uh, you know, of a very different language and vocabulary um, than uh, the, uh, the terminal. Um, you know, once again, we have a very specific question in front of us. The question is not whether we like the design. Um, I think that, you know, the, the design that was presented to us tonight is very much praiseworthy. It is a high quality design and, you know, SOM is uh, an immensely talented firm and uh, no one is denying that. Uh, the, the treatment, and as Barbara said, you know, the expression um, of the base is actually not sympathetic to, uh, to the landmark. It is very overpowering and, uh, you know, a, a better, more subtle, lighter touch would be uh, more appropriate. Um, I think that, you know, as much as materiality inside the, uh, the lobby is uh, stone, what we read is actually glass and metal. Um, also, uh, you know, these uh, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, uh, diagonal lines that, uh, you know, go up with the, the, the staircase and the uh, escalators inside the lobby, uh, you know, very much throw off this uh, symmetry. 
that um, that otherwise is very nicely worked uh, and expressed on the uh, on the front facade. Um, I think that the, there's a suburban quality to, uh, to to the building at the base that I find uh, you know disturbing and and uninspiring next to this uh, you know very precious, delicate, and elegant uh, gem of uh, of the terminal. Um, so I I think that um, you know if if I base my observation on uh, the comments that we received. It looks like uh, the uh, harmonious relationship is uh, not met in the opinion of, um, of the, uh, the committee. Um, so I will uh, make a motion uh, reflecting this, uh, uh, this, this majority view um, to uh, uh, recommend uh, denial of um, the uh, report for a harmonious relationship with uh, Grand Central Terminal. And uh, I need a second. Second. All right. Are there any questions to the motion? Okay, no questions to the motion. I just want to make it clear that this is part one of the application. Then we're going to take a vote on uh, part two, which is the improvements to Grand Central Terminal, which are, you know, the alterations that are being proposed uh, to lot one, which is the, uh, the, the terminal. So right now we're voting on uh, the harmonious relationship. Um, and the motion is to uh, deny. Um, uh, Buzz. Yes. Renee. Yes. Uh, Laura. Yes. John? Yes. Nick? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Uh, Richard? Yes. Mike? Yes. Sam? Yes. Uh, Chuck? Yes. Janet? I don't know if Janet is still with us. Um, Karen? Present, not entitled. Thank you. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Uh, Peter? I, I'm not sure I heard correctly. I think you said no. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony? Yes. And Leila, I'm a yes. Okay, so, um, and I want, just want to make sure, uh, Janet, um, she is still on the participants list. I don't know if maybe she stepped away. Um, okay, so uh, motion carries on uh, this one. So that's part one. Um, now part two is um, the improvements that are uh, being proposed to uh, Grand Central Terminal. Um, you know, it's, it's a typical certificate of appropriateness that we are uh, reviewing. Uh, you know, they're basically making some alterations uh, to the, the um, uh, you know, the, the, the Lexington uh, passageway and, uh, and, you know, some elements uh, to the east side of the, uh, of the interior of, uh, of the terminal. So um, do we have any comments on uh, this aspect. I know that we were you know, much more focused on um, the uh, harmoniousness report um, than on, um, on the alterations and improvements. Um, any uh, comments on the improvements? All right, we need some comments. Um, Tony, go ahead. Yeah, the, um, you know, I, I think the increased uh, halls, the width of the halls and all of that, especially coming from 42nd Street, we all know what that one entrance to the subway is like. It's, uh, it's an absolute nightmare, no matter what time of day or night. Um, the general, having that secondary uh, entrance as well, that'll be more under the, uh, the lot 30, I think is going to help with uh, a lot of, of splitting of the traffic, but more so the, you know, something I, I re-looked at a couple of times were the shifting of the, um, I don't know what to call them, the offshoots of the main passages into Vanderbilt Hall. Um, you know, they're creating symmetry with uh, some of these areas, which I'm a very big fan of. I think that they, um, they're going to do a great job with that. That's going to be a big improvement. Shifting the retail spaces a little bit uh, in order to, to have that symmetry and to allow for better flow. I think it's all, um, all, all pretty positive. 
Thank you, Tony. Uh, Barbara. Um, I, I agree with um, Tony's assessments of the improvements uh, within Grand Central. Um, having been there many times during rush hour, it, it, it is a huge bottleneck that requires uh, people there to direct traffic. So all of that is, is definitely a plus. Um, I, have, I have a few reservations about the plazas on the upper level, only because my experience in New York is that they, you know, maybe people will discover this, but they tend, spaces like that on an upper level tend not to be used as much as they would be on the ground level. Um, I think that there is kind of a feeling like it doesn't quite belong to the public realm the way that something on the street does. Um, and um, so that, that I have a reservation. I mean, certainly you can look at something like the High Line, but the High Line is, of course, a very different beast. So I have, I have a few. It's not that I don't think that uh, some of these spaces will be a nice public amenity. I, I just, I'm not sure, um, you know, if, how, how much they'll benefit people and how much they'll be used, but that's all I really wanted to say. Okay, Th thank, thank you, Barbara. Um, any other comments on, on that? So it looks like the, the sense, if I read the room correctly, is that we have no objections and that we see some uh, of these alterations as, uh, as improvements. Uh, Suzanne, you have your hand up. Suzanne, go ahead. I also just wanted to commend them. It seemed um, that they were very sympathetic to um, the flow and so forth within the context of how people would interact and what needs to be improved on. So I, I really do applaud them. I think Barbara makes a really excellent point and I, I like that very much. I hadn't thought about that, Barbara, and I think that's something that should be you know, thought through if, if they're just listening and, and want to attend to that. I think that that's a, an excellent thing to bring up. And I thought that they were, I can't really remember exactly where it was, but I know that they had done some acknowledgement to the historic preservation part and that they had added that as part of their plan and I appreciated that. I thought that was well done. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Yeah, is the part, the piece that Barbara mentioned, is that in the purview of the second piece? I thought it was just the interior um, part of Grand Central, not really the... Yeah, you're, you're correct. The other uh, part two is uh, the interior uh, okay. alterations. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I take back everything I just said. No, don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I kind of was puzzled about the use of space and what that's going to look like. I guess the thing I do like about it is that it at least opens up so we can see more of Grand Central. But then obviously, like I voted yes on the previous section because of the harmony. And then I would just add, um, I commute. I commuted every day through Grand Central. I work across the street, uh, and and I really think that these improvements they mentioned are, are great. I like the light that's going to be going through. I like that they removed some of the retail space to leave room. I like the symmetry that Tony mentioned. So, good work there. That's all. Thank you, thank you. And I think that the the reopening of this uh, this entrance, I think, is also going to be a. Uh, an improvement, and I think it's going to be done uh, absolutely the correct way. I have no doubt uh, on, on that. Um, okay, so if I read the room correctly, uh, we are in favor of part two of this application. Uh, so I will make a motion to uh, approve uh, part two of uh, this application improvements to Grand Central Terminal. Second. All right. Um, and uh, Buzz. Yes. Renee? Yes. Uh, Laura? Yes. John? Yes. Nick? Yes. Suzanne? You're muted, but I yes. think... Yes. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Yes. Uh, Mike? Mike? back. Yes. Uh, Sam? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Janet? Yes. Uh, Karen? Present, not entitled. 
Um, Barbara? Yes. Peter? Yes. And Tony? Yes. All right. Uh, and Leila, I'm a yes. Okay, so uh, the motion passes uh, unanimously. Um, so thank you very much to the team of applicants. Um, thank you for uh, all your uh, time and uh, work on, on this and uh, thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, now we are uh, moving on to uh, our second application, a second and final application of the evening, 250 Fifth Avenue. This is an application for modifications to a previously approved hotel entrance doors and canopy on 28th Street, as well as a new entrance door and canopy on Fifth Avenue in an uh, existing entrance. And um, I think we have the applicants with us. Um, we did have the applicant with us. Um, hopefully they're still with us. Uh, Sean, I don't see you anymore. Do we have Sean Bessler with us? I know that Sean was um, on the call early on and um, I don't see them. I'll send them an email to let them know and see if they've had any technical difficulties if they can log back in. Great. Thank you, Marisa. Um, hmm. That is an unusual situation. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, oh, Sam says that Sean is actually an attendee. Okay, let's see. Where is Sean? I actually don't see Sean as Okay, so it looks like they, they may have uh, technical difficulties. So bear, bear with us. Um, give, give me a, a few minutes. Okay. So I, just, I just promoted them to a panel so we should be able to. Okay, it looks like Sean was um, able to reconnect. Here you are. We Thank you. Computation. <laughs> I was on, but for some reason, uh, you you all couldn't see me. So thank you for, for fixing this. Okay, thank you. And uh, the uh, floor or the screen is yours, and uh, we are uh, ready to hear your uh, presentation. Great. I'll share my, um, my screen here. Um, Um, for some reason, I'm not able to pull the um, pull the presentation up. It's not allowing me. It's saying that I'm not allowed to share. Um, if you, um, you should be allowed to share, I don't see anything that would keep you. Let me try here one more time. Hang on. I, I don't see anything that's keeping you from sharing. Um, okay. Let's try this again. Okay. There we go now. Fantastic. Perfect. Yay. Okay. We can hear you. We can see the presentation. We are Great. ready. All right. Thank you for, for having us and thank you for fixing the, the technical difficulties here. 
Um, this is 250 Fifth Avenue, uh, which is a, a building that's under construction. Uh, it's been presented at the community board as, as well as landmarks a, a couple times uh, for approvals. It's currently under construction. Uh, uh, it's a, an old McKim Mead and White building, which was uh, built in, uh, I think, 1908. Uh, and then a new tower next to it. It's on the corner of 28th Street and Fifth Avenue. It's a luxury hotel. And uh, what this application is, is for the amendment of the two entrances. There's an entrance on 28th Street, which is the main hotel entrance, and an entrance on, on Fifth Avenue, which is the entrance to a new restaurant. The reason we're presenting this now is it did go through uh, first, I think, in 2012. But at the time, the program wasn't really quite settled, and there was somewhat of a placeholder uh, in there for the, uh, for the entrances, because these are the main entrances. Um, and then it was presented again in 2016, but again, the, the operator and the, the restaurant and the program wasn't finalized. So through, throughout the years, as, as, um, as we've gone through this, as the program has, uh, has evolved, uh, we've, we've uh, amended things accordingly. And I think we, the last time we were back in front of Community uh, Board 5 was uh, for the, the, the renovation uh, and the restoration of the windows uh, on the historic building uh, on the corner. So, um, but just to give you a little, little bit of context. So what, we're, what we'll be presenting today is the, the main entrance on, on 28th Street and then the main entrance, uh, which is uh, on, on Fifth Avenue. Um, looking back through history, uh, first of all, this is, it's an incredibly beautiful building. Uh, we would, if anybody has a chance to walk by it and see it under construction, it's, it's really wonderful. We've, uh, we started to take some of the scaffolding now, down now. We've really restored the whole building. Uh, the new, new tower is up next to it and it's really coming along, along quite well. Uh, but, but as, as, as the program has evolved and, and, uh, uh, and now we have the restaurant and hotel in place, uh, the idea is, is to have uh, a little bit more identifiable entrance uh, that's harmonious uh, to the rest of the building on both 5th Avenue and, and 28th Street. The original building, uh, which was done by McKim, Mead and White, uh, they actually the, had two entrances, one on 5th Avenue, which was the uh, sort of the main entrance to the banking hall, which is a very grand entrance um, uh, and, and uh, was, was amended a, a few years later. 28th Street was actually uh, a separate entrance uh, and, and there were these light wells that went down. Neither one of them had, had any, any canopy or, or, or any, anything um, at the time. Um, fast forward a few years in 1913, there was a, a small canopy added to, um, actually it was 19, 1911, there was a small canopy added to 28th Street, which was a uh, very sort of thin metal and looked like a canvas awning uh, with a couple posts on it. So nothing really contextual uh, with the building. And then in 1913 on, on 28th Street, uh, uh, an entrance was added and, and, the, and the, the, the entrance doors and everything were pushed back. So it was, it was sort of evolved over, over time. On Fifth Avenue, uh, the entrance was also evolved and these really beautiful old wooden metal doors were installed and they would open them uh, during the banking hours and close them in the evening. But they had this wonderful, beautiful sort of rivets to them and, and, and a lot of uh, 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 really interesting details. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the building is on the corner of 28th Street and, and Fifth Avenue. Um, on, on 28th Street, this is the, the entrance that we're, we're talking about. Uh, which is the entrance to the hotel. And uh, whenever uh, uh, this was first presented in 2012, uh, this was the existing uh, building. It had this sort of you know, non-contextual signage across uh, the front of it. And uh, without really understanding what was gonna be in there, uh, the presentation was to kind of keep it uh, with the sort of non-contextual entrance. It was sort of set back from the street that was what the, it wasn't the original building, it wasn't historic, but it was sort of what was existing at the time. And then a canopy, which was somewhat similar to what was, what was in, in, uh, in 1913. Uh, as, as we evolved the project and uh, the, the, the level of quality of the hotel and the operator were a little bit more identified, uh, we did work with landmarks to refine that a little bit. There was, there was this sort of, uh, uh, transom this uh, that was added on a little bit later, uh, which was not at, not in any condition to be kept. So 
uh, we had uh, we eventually had to, to remove that. But um, the idea was that we pulled the the, the storefront out, uh, the entrance out to match the existing historic plane of, of where the entrance was, um, and also lighten it up a little bit to match the uh, the windows. Again, this was a, a little bit of a, a placeholder, not knowing uh, what the final operator was going to be. So this was presented in 2016 and approved at at Landmarks. Now, where we are today, we have the operator in place, the, the, the restaurant, the chef and everything in place, and uh, we want to, to enhance the quality of this. So what we've done is taken a fresh look at the entrance. It is the main entrance to the hotel. We want something that's both contextual, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, historic in nature with what the McKimmina White Building would be. It harkens to what was there um, uh, before, but not tries to mimic it because it was sort of added on to several times uh, over, over the years. So the proposal is a, um, uh, a bronze uh, door, uh, which is full height. The, the, uh, the, the mullions pick up the, uh, the horizontals uh, on the windows to the left and the right. Um, a canopy which has a little bit more thickness to it, so it allows us to give uh, some signage to it uh, that, uh, that announces the hotel, but in a very elegant way. And uh, rather than trying to imitate something that was, was there and kind of added on over the years, uh, try, uh, trying to have a, a transom, this sort of grill which sits out in, in front of the window, uh, a little bit more elegant, elegant way, but again, having uh, some historical character to it. So this is the proposal. For the um, uh, for the 28th Street uh, uh, hotel entrance, and and as you see, it's a very simple canopy uh, using the same tiebacks um, uh, of of what was there before. One thing to note is the location of this entrance is not in the same location of of what the entrance to the bank was. Th this was what was presented in in 2012. The entrance moved uh, about four bays down on 28th Street. There's a, a small annex, but, but the, taking the idea of what was, what was there previously, but, but putting it in a, in a different location. So the location of where the entrance is was, was presented and, and approved before. Um, a little zooming in a little bit uh, on this. It's, it's a very simple uh, canopy. Uh, it has some concealed up lighting in it. Uh, very minimal, uh, has, has a, the ability to have a little bit of signage on the side in a, in a nice discreet way. And then the chain tiebacks, which are, are, are very similar to, to uh, what was there in, in 19, 1913. Uh, we are proposing uh, to bring back these, uh, uh, these lamps, these sconces uh, on both sides of the entrance. Uh, we've, we've, we've taken the, we've, we've been able to uh, pull the historic photos and we're going to replicate them uh, on both 28th Street as well as Fifth Avenue. And we'll work with an artist uh, to, uh, to replicate those, those old gas lamps that used to be there in a, in a really interesting way. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's a metal canopy uh, with a bronze, uh, bronze storefront. And then inside of it, it, nothing changes from what was presented uh, before and approved at Landmarks. It's a, it's a vestibule here, and then you enter the, um, into the, um, uh, uh, the hotel lobby. Um, this just shows the, the light well, uh, what we, you know, we, we, we have some very simple up lights in there. They're concealed, uh, but the idea is that this light well that's been there, it had pipes and all kinds of stuff running through there. We're, we've cleaned all that out. We've actually restored the windows because uh, these sort of old windows went all the way down. We, we've opened them up. We've kind of uh, uh, put some lighting on them and restored them. But to give a little bit of, uh, of ambiance to it, so uh, we're, we're proposing just a, a little bit of glow within this light well to give a little bit of ambiance to the street. So the lighting had not been presented before. So Landmarks had asked us to include it with this application. Um, so just a, a, a very small glow within the light well, which, which happens along 28th Street uh, along each of the windows. And then this just shows some of the details uh, that, we're, that, that we're talking about uh, on, on the, the windows and, and the lighting. And then this is, this is a rendering, a rendered elevation of 28th Street. Uh, all of all of these uh, are are all restored wood wind or actually brand new wood windows uh, replicating what was there historic. Uh, uh, we presented this I think in 2016, uh, but this is the uh, the new proposed entrance. And as you could see, what we had presented originally to 
to community board as well as to landmarks was was uh, not not quite as as uh, as elegant as, as as what we're proposing now. And then this is a rendering of the of the entrance of of 20 A Street, uh, very clean, very simple, um, and uh, and fitting within the uh, uh, the opening. And a section. This shows how far out the canopy would come. The canopy would come out to as far as the uh, the, the previous two canopies did, uh, and then have the tiebacks uh, with the two chains. On Fifth Avenue, uh, this this uh, entrance has has not been presented to community board or to to landmarks before. The reason was when it was originally presented, it wasn't. Um, uh, it was actually going to remain a bank, and uh, everything everything was going to stay the same with the tenant. But as the project evolved, uh, the tenant moved out. Uh, this is what was existing: this sort of terrible aluminum awning and, and aluminum um, uh, storefronts uh, with this uh, across the top. So we've taken all of this down. The facade is completely restored now, and uh, what this proposal is is uh, uh, is is for this opening opening here in two thousand. 16, we did work with landmarks to kind of put a placeholder in here. Uh, this is what was what was worked with staff at, at landmarks uh, with it within the drawings. Uh, but again, it, there was no no chef, no restaurants, uh, and, and no program of uh, what was going to be happening behind there. So now fast forward to today. Uh, our proposal is to develop uh, a much more elegant uh, entrance here. Uh, one that takes its uh, its cues from those big wooden riveted doors that were there before, but does it in a little bit more contemporary way uh, with um, with a, a, a bronze door. Uh, we are proposing uh, the same uh, sort of uh, uh, spindled transom at the top, which will which will uh, relate back to 28th Street uh, and tie the two facades to, or the two entrances together. But we are also proposing a small little eyebrow here uh, on top of it. So it allows us to have uh, a little bit of break in the, in the door, but it also allows us to have a signage there for the restaurant, uh, but not to the scale of what's on 20A Street. This is a little bit much shorter, uh, not as deep. Uh, it'll be self-supporting without the tiebacks on it and allow us to have the, uh, the signage on the, sign, uh, on the side, which is a uh, Cafe Carmelini. This is a just an enlarged uh, uh, elevation of the uh, of the uh, proposed entrance, and you can see some of the detail of what we're trying to do to to not not recreate but to uh, give a nod back to those really beautiful historic doors that used to be there. Uh, regarding the sconces, again, we would be recreating the, uh, the exact sconces that were there, or as close to them as as we can get, uh, and then. This is the uh, the section through the door. So really high doors or the appearance of a high door. Actually, they would open a little bit lower, but they'd have from the street this appearance of, of, a, of the very big doors like those old banking doors that were there, which they would open during the banking hours. Um, and uh, and then with the, uh, the, the the eyebrow little canopy there. This is a, a rendered elevation. So you can see that would have a little bit of glow behind it. Uh, so at night, it would it would uh, really be nice. Uh, the idea also is to give a little bit of privacy to the restaurant, so you're not actually looking in there. So that's why we thought that this um, opacity would be uh, would would be quite interesting. This is a, a couple renderings uh, showing some of the details of this. Uh, just a very simple, elegant, uh, clean clean entrance, and then a section. Uh, showing how how deep the the eyebrow would be, and then a um, little bit different than 20A Street, you you actually come in here and there's this double height space, and actually we restored the whole bank, the old banking hall to this restaurant, which is really quite interesting. Um, should be a pretty cool space. Uh, we we wanted to to look at other precedents uh, throughout the city and then the neighborhood, um, and these are some of the things that we we, we sort of had been going through with landmarks. Uh, some of these are a little bit overstated, uh, which we wanted to stay away from, but um, nonetheless, the idea of a of sort of a metal and glass canopies were were things that we we looked at. But what we did want to settle on were things that were uh, uh, more designed within the the entrance, uh, not really calling attention to itself. Uh, and something that could actually easily be changed later if uh, the use changes or, or, um, or the restaurant changes. 
so these are these are some of the uh, uh, other other uh, buildings uh, and things that we were inspired by and and uh, looked of buildings of the similar period uh, that we we worked through with landmarks. And and with and with it on Fifth Avenue, one of the the questions has has been: Are there other precedents of, of buildings with a canopy on it? And there are uh, right up the street. Uh, however, not big marquees, and that's what we really wanted to stay away from. On while while 28th Street does have the the entrance with the tiebacks on it, uh, and there is historical precedent for that. On Fifth Avenue, we really wanted we wanted the eyebrow to give us a little bit of coverage, uh, uh, from, you know, at the entrance, but also uh, the ability to have signage, but not something that's going to stick out too far and uh, and really detract uh, from the building or from the entrance. And these are just some other examples on Fifth Avenue where there where there are uh, other other uh, canopies or, or eyebrows. So that's. That's the, uh, the, the presentation. We have a number, number of things in the appendix if, if people have, have questions, but uh, we'd love to, to hear your comments. Fantastic. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation. Um, let's jump right into uh, questions from members of the committee. And uh, Renee, you're first. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about the opacity of the window. Um, do we have any, um, um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. So I'm someone have me. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. So, is there anything else in the in the neighborhood that we found that is contextual or a precedent for uh, usage of that sort of a, a, opaque window for for a main window? You know, I, I did see in some of the others uh, things that you showed that there's the use of milk glass or frosted glass in canopies. Uh, but for actual windows themselves, off the top of my head, I can't think of any that we've seen. So that's my only concern is whether or not that poses uh, a contextuality or a precedent issue historically. Um, we didn't look at that that, that deeply about that the uh, that part of the materiality. What we did research really was the canopy, and are there other precedents of that on on Fifth Avenue? Um, I, I think it's something we can we can look at the type of uh, of glass that's used. Uh, we wanted something that gives a, a little bit of glow at night, uh, but still has that that look of being a bit more of a solid, uh, more financial door. Thank you. Um, other questions from uh, members of the uh, committee. Any other questions? I can't find Ray's hand. Can I actually ask another question? Yeah, go ahead, Renee. Uh, real quick. So I, I love that you're bringing back the um, the look of the, the gas uh, the gas sconces. Um, what are you lighting them with? Just regular LED lights, or are they going to be sort of mimicking a, a flame? Like I know there are flame bulbs out there. Uh, and the second part of that question is, what exactly will the fixtures be made out of? Um, the, the, right now, uh, they're, as far as I know, they're going to be LED. Um, so you wouldn't see the, the, the flame in there. We couldn't find anything that actually showed that, it, how they actually worked. Um, so the, the idea is that they're, they're just lit by, by LED. Um, they're, they're sort of this, uh, I think they're out like uh, metal, like a wrought, wrought, wrought iron, um, is what they'll be made out of. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen, you have a question. Go ahead. Hi, yes, I have two questions. Can you talk a little bit about the, if you're going to introduce um, a, like a distinctive paving pattern for the CC or is that embedded in concrete and what, what is the material of that? Is it brass? And the second question is about the, um, the graphic pattern that's underneath the canopy. Can you describe that a little bit? Um, so the, the CC, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can't do anything in the sidewalk uh, with the DOT, so we won't be able to do that. That would actually be something that that would be a carpet or something that would be put out, out outside. So unfortunately, we're limited uh, with with what we can do at the uh, with the DOT there. Um, so so that I think that's maybe a little bit mis misleading there. Um, under underneath the, uh, the the canopy, uh, it's uh, the idea is that there are these sort of um, uh, uh, 
things that that uh, represent what's going on in the in the restaurant. So you have some grapes and some glasses and, and things like that. So it's just a sort of a, a this this lit panel that's that's glowing that uh, uh, will 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 go along with the branding of of the restaurant, which is Cafe Carmelini. Thank you, Karen. Do you have a follow up question? Does that address your your uh, your question? Karen? Karen, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Okay, so I'll consider that um, you don't have any follow-ups. If you do, uh, raise your hand. Um, any more questions from uh, members of the, uh, the committee? Uh, Renee, you have a follow-up? Um, Renee, do you have a follow-up question? I asked many questions. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions from uh, members of the um, of the committee? Okay, so seeing none, um, I will open up the floor to members of the public. Do we have any questions or comments from members of the public? You can use the raise hand function uh, at the uh, bottom of your screen. Any questions or uh, comments from members of the public? Okay, so seeing none, I will move back to uh, business, well, we'll move into business session where only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter and uh, we are making comments. So um, who wants to start with a comment on this application. Any comments on this? Um, let me see, Suzanne. Suzanne, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, can you hear me? You can, okay. Yes, yeah, yes. I, I just, uh, I applaud them. I think we've sat through this. I thought their, um, the details, replication work, um, the appearance of these high doors. I know, I think that they, I like that they chose that. Um, the illumination, I do find the opaque glass. I have to say the window, I find that a little strange, but barring that, um, well done. That's my comment. Thank you. Um, so j just for a little bit of, uh, of context, the, um, the, the sort of, you know, big item here is not really in the design, which I think it's, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that it is very sympathetic to the building. The one big question is um, the addition of a canopy on Fifth Avenue is something new. And although there are existing canopies on Fifth Avenue, as uh, the applicant just uh, showed us, um, these canopies, if I'm not mistaken, are outside of historic districts. So the, the question beyond, uh, you know, the, the merits strictly of, of this application, the question uh, is, uh, you know, whether this kind of precedent uh, could uh, come and haunt us in, uh, in the future. So, you know, just putting that for, uh, for context and, and uh, discussion. Um, any other uh, comments from members of the committee? Any other comments? I have a comment. Can you hear me? Renee, I'm going to call on you again. Um, someone is talking. I can hear someone who says they have a comment and can you hear them? But they're very soft. I'm sorry, say, say that again. I can hear somebody else talking, but they're very soft. I think Karen's talking. I think so, yeah. Yes, so, yeah someone else is saying, can you hear me? Karen? So, can I? So the, the, but the canopy in question is not the one that we're looking at on the screen. It's the other one. Is that, is that correct, Layla? This, this is the canopy. Right. So, so the, the narrower canopy on Fifth Avenue, um, which I, I think, you know, one could make the case that, you know, like strictly narrowly to this building, the proportion and the dimension and the materiality, you know, I think the case can be made that it is contextual and that it is appropriate. The question that I am personally wrestling with is whether this 
canopy on Fifth Avenue creates a precedent that would come and haunt us. In other words, everybody would want a canopy. Well, basically, everybody is going to come and say that their canopies are also, you know, appropriate and contextual. And uh, what will we be able to say? Uh, and that's always, you know, the, the big issue that we have with, uh, with precedents is that, you know, and as you can see, you know, applicants basically bring all these precedents as the ultimate argument for which, you know, we should approve the, uh, the, the applications. So, you know, I'm just bringing that so that, you know, we, we, we don't oversee it. Uh, okay, so it looks like Karen has her hand up. Karen, uh, go ahead. And Karen, we cannot hear you. I can see that your mic is open. You're not muted and we cannot hear you. Okay, Richard, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, yeah, following up to uh, uh, what you were saying, Layla, is there, I, I sort of feel like there may be an argument that says, uh, it's contextual with this building. That is, there. It's true. There were no. There was not a uh, uh, a canopy on Fifth Avenue, but there was a canopy on the building. Uh, I understand that someone will say, "So what?" There would have not been a now Fifth Avenue is okay, but uh, you know, I don't know where to go with that. But it just seems to me I'm looking at this going. It is contextual with the building. No, there was not one there before, but there was one on 28th Street and it's a single building. So it looks like it fits in. Uh, again, I don't know what to do about that. And I sound like you weren't really sure what to do about it either. Yeah, correct. Okay, we need more comments. Karen, uh, hopefully your audio is fixed. Karen, can you, um, can you make your comment? And we cannot hear you still. Karen, if, if your audio is not working, you could type it into the chat as well. He, he did. put it in the chat. He it's did. The chat. Karen is asking uh, where the original canopy was. The original canopy was on 28th Street. So historically, this building did have a really large and uh, you know substantial uh, canopy on uh, 28th Street. And Sean, I don't know if you can bring us back to the historic photograph um, at the beginning of the presentation. Here you go. So you can see that, you know, historically there was a canopy. It was very substantial. Um, and um, there was no canopy on Fifth Avenue. And you can see the, uh, the you know, the door treatment uh, to uh, Fifth Avenue on the, uh, the historic photograph to your, to your right. Um, Renee, do you have a follow-up uh, comment? Oh, I see, yeah, Renee, do you have a follow-up comment? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I have the same issue that you do. I, I see the precedent's always an issue for me. But in this case, um, you know, I can think of a few places uh, in the visual corridor of Fifth Avenue, which, as you guys know, for the past eight years, like, is always a big stickler for me, is making sure we, we are uh, sympathetic to um, the visual corridor. There are already uh, similar canopies um, that are actually uh, more modern looking um, and slightly larger um, that are already there in retail. So, I mean, in a way they're already using those things as precedent for this one. So on one hand, I do see that the precedent is the slippery slope because that's what they're using to bolster theirs. Um, on the other, we're already kind of in that mess. Um, so if more folks- that's your point, Renee. If more people are gonna ask for them, then we might've already, you know, been in that issue. So I'm actually fine with this canopy because there are already others on fifth, but I might be in the minority on that. Okay, okay. Uh, Tony, do you have a comment? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Leila, I think you, you pointed out already that um, some of the examples that, although they are nearby, they're not necessarily in the Madison Square North Historic District. Um, 
and typically we we don't approve these. We don't see them often. Uh, well, I guess maybe we do see them try to come up, but we don't often approve them um, coming into these. I think for me, it's a little more black and white. Um, although it's absolutely stunning, I think overall, um, we've seen their applications a, a couple times. Um, and, and as you guys have said, it is contextual. There was precedent for one on 28th Street that was not on Fifth Avenue. Um, should somebody come forward in the future? I mean, it's a very simple explanation as to why 28th Street would have, would have one. I think giving Fifth Avenue uh, a canopy would be a little bit dangerous in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Barbara, do you have uh, a comment? Um, yeah, I, just to follow up on your comment, I, I, I think I agree with his comment. I don't have a real problem with it in terms of the way it looks, the proposed facade looks. Um, although when I look at the historic uh, facade, it, there is, it, it does really kind of break it up a little bit. Um, uh, which isn't quite in keeping of the original design. And I am concerned um, that uh, I think the more I hear and the more I think about it, that it, it does set a precedence that it would be hard to um, step back from. I'm not, you know, I'm not really orthodox about these things, but I, I can see that it, it, um, it, it starts you on a slippery slope. Yeah, very much slippery. Uh, Chuck, you have a comment, go ahead. Thank you, Layla. Uh, the, I think the precedent discussion is, is an appropriate one for the committee. I think that the committee can always exercise its judgment and discretion when it comes to looking at a particular application. And, and the problem with trying to apply a precedent in advance is that we end up end up having to decide every application with this one. And that's not what's before us. And so I, I guess my perspective is it, it looks nice to me. It looks fine. I'm not worried about the precedent because I'm confident the future committees can find another reason to say no to any canopy they don't like. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I, I think that the, the, the more I think about it, I think, um, rather than finding a reason why we would say no to the next one that we don't find appropriate, I think we should uh, work right here, right now to find a reason why we should say yes, if indeed we want to say yes. So that it is not creating a precedent, but it is just basically, you know, assessing a proposal based on their merits. Uh, and I, like would say, thank you, that I, that I would say it's appropriate and, and contextual and consistent with the one that's right around the corner. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if this building was an individual landmark, uh, not in a historic district and not in a, an avenue that has been deemed a uh, exceptional visual corridor, which is the case of Fifth Avenue, um, I would probably be um, less conflicted, let's put it this way. Um, so, you know, maybe um, it's one of those instances where, you know, we, we should uh, you know, maybe strip back these, um, these concerns uh, to get to, you know, the, uh, the, the true substance of, uh, of the application. Um, any other uh, comments? Okay, so if I read the, the room correctly, um, we do find that uh, all the elements of this uh, proposal are uh, appropriate and uh, very sympathetic to the building, uh, great materials. Um, uh, okay, hold on, Karen just typed a message. Um, okay, she says, I feel a contextual design canopy attracts the eye to the entrance, especially this narrow frontage on Fifth Avenue. Um, okay, th th thank you, uh, Karen. I assume that this is a comment in support of this design. Um, okay, and Karen says, yes, support. Uh, thank you. 
Um, okay, so in, you know, in, in essence, we struggle with the notion of uh, precedent, although we don't specifically struggle with this actual canopy. This is pretty much where we are. So um, I think a motion along the lines of an approval with very specific reasons why this canopy is appropriate, although there's no historic precedent, and why, and why a, um, it should not be considered. Uh, uh, Janet, do you, do you have a comment, Janet? No, am I broadcasting? Okay, uh, J Janet, do you, do you have a comment to this? Okay. No. I just had my button depressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, I'm I'm not sure if if Janet has a comment. I I wasn't sure um what what the comment uh was. So the motion would be. I think, I think she just had a problem with her mute button. But oh. Okay. 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 Got it. Thank you. Um, so the, the motion uh, would be to approve and to explain very specifically why this element is appropriate and why it is not setting a precedent. So that, that, that would be the motion. Um, are there any comments or objections to uh, taking this viewpoint? Uh, Suzanne. I knew, I knew that that's what this was about, and I did not have a problem with it contextually. You know, I have never approved a canopy um, one time on this, on this uh, board, but th in this instance, I feel like with that, how you phrased it is very appropriate. I, th I would approve that, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, Tony. Uh, thanks, Leila. Um, <clears throat> So your comment about making, we're able to make a comment about why this one is appropriate, why we are able to, to approve this one. Um, can you just go over what those points would be in a resolution? Um, again, I'm, I'm just trying to think of how somebody down the road wouldn't be able to utilize this because I haven't, and maybe I've missed something, um, I haven't heard a lot that screams this one should be pushed forward. I haven't heard a lot of different different reason uh, rationale for that. Yes, sure. Um, very very good question and very good point. Um, so you know, I'm I'm going to tell you how I see it, and uh, you know, then I will let the uh, other members of the committee to uh, you know develop, expand, or uh, contradict as as they see fit. Um, I think that the proportion of the building is is one reason. Um, it has actually a narrow frontage on Fifth Avenue and has a much larger uh, frontage on the, on 28th Street. Um, the, uh, the the metal uh, canopy, you know, the the, the material treatment, um, I think is uh, is harmonious and and you know works well. I think that the symmetry between the 28th Street and the Fifth Avenue um, entrances, you know, the sort of echo. Uh, of one another with, you know, the same arch articulation and the same horizontal line of um, this uh, canopy metal element with the same kind of lighting treatment, um, I think makes it a, uh, you know, harmonious and contextual um, uh, expression on, uh, on, on the building. Um, and, um, and I think also, you know, something that I see as, as a positive is that they are, uh, you know, proposing a canopy that does not stick out uh, too much as, you know, we have seen others in, uh, in historic districts that we have actually uh, voted against um, on, on side streets that were really enormous. Um, you know, th this one is, uh, is of, of more uh, reasonable proportions. Um, so, you know, th those would be the, the, the reasons uh, to, to support our uh, resolution in favor. Do you want to share any thoughts, Tony? Um, I'm happy to vote with, with the committee on this. Um, I, 
you know, I expressed my opinion. I disagree. There, there wasn't one there originally. I would vote no for this. Um, I still don't know if I've heard. I'm okay with that if the committee agrees with that. I still don't know if I've heard language that's very specific to this building that a future applicant would not be able to use. Um, I agree with everything you said about this one, that it's not you know, going to the sidewalk. It's, it's relatively small in stature. Um, you know, I, I totally agree with all of that. Again, I'm just going back to precedent. It seems like most applicants would be able to use our rationale for, for their own building. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to vote with the committee. Layla, you're muted. Layla, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, Karen uh, left a message in, in the chat saying that in addition to the point that I made, there may not have been a canopy on Fifth Avenue, but there is a precedent for a canopy on this building uh, by McKee, Made and White. Most of other applications come with new canopies that were, that there wasn't one originally. Where, I'm sorry, where there wasn't one originally. So uh, her, her point is to say that, you know, it, it, there, there was a precedent for canopy treatment on, on this building, which is why um, it becomes more uh, appropriate. Okay, that, that point I do agree with. Um, okay, so uh, Suzanne, you have your hand up. Another comment? Suzanne, do you have another comment? All I was going to say um, with regard to, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. So um, I think that Tony also raises such a great point in terms of how we, the language of it. And so maybe Layla, this is more of a question really than it is um, my adding to your, what you've, what you've articulated, but is it at all possible? I know this is specific to the canopy, but is there any, possible again the question language to use because they have made such an effort to restore and honor the building and that also lent itself to uh, again this is a question to our decision in the you know the overall presentation of the efforts made to um for the historic preservation and honoring the building um Again, a question, I'm not sure if that's any language that can or cannot be used because I know this is specific to a canopy. That's my question. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think it's, it's a very good point. You know, we, we often uh, you know, take into account the quality of, uh, you know, the overall quality of the uh, restorative work. And, you know, we have to keep in mind that for this particular building, you know, this is, I think, the third time that this building is in front of us. They've done, you know, extensive window restoration. I mean, they, they've really, spend a lot of time, effort, and money in uh, restoring the building. So I think this is appropriate to add that as, um, as language. Okay, so we need to bring this to a wrap. Um, it looks like, you know, overall, uh, the committee is in favor of, uh, of this application in its entirety, including the, uh, the, the two uh, proposed canopies. Um, and uh, unless there is strong objection, which I don't see, we're going to take this to a vote. This would be the uh, final vote of the evening. So the motion will be uh, to approve with a very clear language as to the rationale for this, uh, for this approval. Uh, are there any questions to the motion? Okay, I need a second on the motion. Second. Okay. And this is the final vote of the evening. Uh, Buzz. Yes. Renee. Yes. Uh, Laura. Yes. John? Yes. Nick? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Uh, Richard? Yes. Uh, Mike? I'll come back to him. Sam? Yes, yes. Mike. Uh, and Mike is a yes. Thanks. Uh, Chuck? Yes. Janet? Yes. Karen, Karen uh, said in the chat that she's a uh, yes. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Uh, Peter? Yes. Tony? Yes. And Layla? 
Tamayas, yes, thank you. Tony, thank, thank you very much for voting with the committee. I, I really appreciate that. I think that, uh, you know, presenting a, uh, a unanimous vote is, uh, is a very strong signal. And uh, I really appreciate that, you know, when, when committee members are able to, you know, make this effort to, to reach out to the, the majority of, uh, of the voice so that we have a unanimous vote, uh, I think is very important and very much appreciated. Um, on that note, I wanna thank the applicant for a, a great presentation and a great uh, quality of uh, work, including restoration, which we very much appreciate. And um, on that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Good night, all. Okay. Bye. Thank you.